Hello, hello. Right. And here we are. You're back again. Hey, guys. And as Everyone. you can see, we have a very special guest on the show today, Mr. Nathan Peck. Hello, Nathan. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here. It is a, a, a distinct honor and privilege to have you on the show. So I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to what we're going to discuss today. But um, so for those of you who regularly watch the show, as you can see, this is day two without Brent. It's uh, <laughs> hey, and oh, he, he's there. he said hello. He's so it's always good. Just know that while Brent may not be here visually, Brent is here visually in chat. So <laughs> anyways, yeah. um, and uh, oh, look, OK, so we have uh, the Smash Show. Welcome back. Yeah. Thanks, Pavin. Um, welcome back, uh, the Smasha. So uh, <laughs> for all of our regulars, please chime in and say hello. It's always good to see you. And yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be good to get uh, get to know where people are joining from as well, like which city or wherever you are. It'd be great. Um, so welcome again uh, to our regulars. My name is Pavan Mystery. And uh, yeah, if you join here um, regularly, we have Brent and Adam hosting the show. Um, uh, last two days, yeah, I'm, I'm joining. But we we are glad to have Nathan uh, Peck on our show. So welcome, Nathan. And he's he's our colleague. He he works as a developer advocate as well. Nathan, why don't you introduce yourself and um, and tell our viewers how long you've been with AWS, and what's your role, and what do you like like doing? Yeah, sure. So I'm a senior developer advocate on the container uh, team at AWS, and I've been here about four years uh, prior to uh, joining AWS, I worked at a couple different startups. And so I come from a startup background, I come from like the real get it hands on, do it yourself and a very small team trying to accomplish big product ideas and build big things with a very small number of engineers. And so I like to take that kind of like uh, builder mentality and bring it into AWS and, and teach people uh, on the engineering team how to build better products that enable the folks who are building startups, trying to build their, their product fast and, you know, get something out the door to their customers. And you do, and you do like, do. yeah, yeah. You know, you. So pr prior to, to joining the team as, as a developer advocate myself, I would always, you know, l watch your blog posts and, and, and your tweets. And it would always just, I felt like you were, you were my spirit animal. Like everything <laughs> you said was just like, yes, let's <laughs> do that. And so, really always just awesome content that thank that you, you thank you so absolutely yeah i um, i mean a recent example i came across was uh, i was looking at some content around fargate networking and i came across your blog uh from uh, i think a couple of years ago um, but it was so well written unfortunately um, i think that one is totally outdated now now we have like all the great AWS vpc mode like <laughs> yeah. i need to I need to make a follow-up on that one yeah, oh, that's cool. But yeah, we move content. fast. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, keep it coming. But we are glad to have you here. And um, what are we going to talk about today? So today I want to show uh, Copilot. And uh, I know uh, AWS Copilot has been mentioned on the show a couple times. So some of the viewers may actually already be familiar with Copilot. Uh, but for those who don't know, AWS Copilot is this new abstraction tool we're making for the command line. Uh, to help you deploy containerized applications more easily. And what we're in specific, I want to do is I want to take an application and deploy using Copilot, and I want to start automating it. Um, so I want to automate the build and release cycle, and then I want to add integration tests to it. Um, so that way, when we are developing new features, we discover a bug, uh, we're able to test and make sure that the, those features are working properly before the application actually hits uh, production. And, you know, so, I, you know what I think... Uh... You know, before we you know dive into the demo and go into these things, I do think it would be cool to just talk about, um, you know, what what does that look like now? You know, like what what's kind of previous to Copilot being here, and you know, we've talked about Copilot as you said on the show, where there's a lot of a it's a very opinionated tool, right? It and it does it handles a lot of that boilerplate and a lot of these, um, just a lot of these resource you're building resources that me as a developer, or frankly, me as an operations person who just wants to move fast, it, it kind of helps eliminate a lot of that work. Can you maybe talk through some of those, you know, some of the things that it does to make life easier for the developer slash operations person? Sure. So 
uh, there's a few different stages to tor sort of building your application. Obviously, there's the uh, source stage where you're actually uh, collecting all of your source code, all your libraries, your runtime, um, different things that your application uh, might require in order to function. And then there's the sort of stage where you say, okay, I want to get all of this stuff uh, to production. I want to run there. And most of the time, people are using Docker images for that these days. Um, if I look broadly like across the industry, a lot of people, when they develop their application, they're putting it into a Docker image. But interacting with Docker directly, it can be done. It's totally something that you should learn, but it's not something that I necessarily want to do day to day. You know, if I'm writing, I'm sitting there typing that Docker build command or Docker run command um, directly, it's, it, it, it feels like something that I shouldn't have to do. And, and most of the time in the past when I was building Docker images myself, um, I would end up making a little shell script that was like, I call it like build.sh or something. Yeah. Just, you know, automate. It's that way I could just type build, yep. you know. I don't I don't necessarily want to type out a full Docker build, Docker run command every time I want to interact with Docker. Um, so we started with that and said, okay, how can we make a tool which sort of finds my Docker file, finds my application, builds it and pushes it for me automatically with one command. And, it's, and that way I don't even have to write a shell script. Uh, you know, this tool already exists. It already understands how to look through the folder, find my application, build it and push it. And then the second sort of stage after that is when I have my Docker container, I need infrastructure to run it on. You know, I need a cluster, I need VPC networking, all these different supporting resources on my AWS account. And creating those things by hand, that's not fun either. No, I don't think anybody likes clicking around the console that much. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that I can do, but day to day, especially if I'm deploying multiple applications, I don't want to go in there and start clicking around. So we said, okay, we can automate that as well. We can take that application, we can spin up the environment and supporting resources and put that application into the environment um, automatically as well. And, you know, just thinking about that, if I were to, to do this by hand right now, it, it would you know, go to the console. I, I need to think about a VPC, as you said. I, there, there's networking, security groups, IAM roles, policies. There's a lot of components that I need to think about, you know, these resources to ensure that I can connect all these pieces together. So by having something like Copilot, which, by the way, um, this mesh is, you know, made a comment here you know, today I'm not going to formulate a question, just taking notes too advanced. I think this is an example of the audience that, that Copilot should be reaching out to, right? Is, hey, I don't want, or I don't have the time to be a, a, an expert in all of these things under, under the covers, but I have an application, I have a Docker container. Now just get this to an environment that's stable, scalable, and production ready. Um, without me having to be an expert in all of the components around. So I think, you know, knowing going into this, this is this is for you. This this is for everyone, you know, from beginner to advanced users. I think you'll see value in Copilot helping you um, get your applications pr to production with tests, which I'm really excited about. I, I gave a little spoiler alert. Uh, Nathan's going to show us some really great integration tests into his app in his application and get that into the pipeline. So um, before we get into it, I just want to, um, yes, Nettle, it has been quite a year, uh, but as Pavan said, he is just drinking water, not vodka. Uh, but we'll see how the show progresses. M maybe it'll, it'll turn to that. Um, Trust me. Trust only me if the demo well. goes horribly bad. <laughs> exactly. If the <laughs> demo goes bad, we'll all be drinking vodka. But um <laughs> And yes, Philip. So I would say, as Nathan was saying, right? We we look at Copilot. Let's shell scripts are great. Like you know, shell scripts. Oftentimes we use them to glue the pieces that are missing. But I think Copilot will. You'll see Copilot is going to definitely replace those shell scripts for the most part. Yeah, I, I think to add to that, uh, Adam and Nathan, I think what we what we are seeing through um, these open source initiatives like CDK or with co-pilots and and the other projects which are out there which are open source is um that's a good comparison that philip made around shell scripts like we are trying to automate and make sure that we are doing the necessary interesting pieces right rather than 
spending so much time on things which are not necessary to do to do the job and and that's what these tools help us do um, so that's what i'm excited about they open up new ways of tackling interesting challenges rather than um using so in my like early days i would like build computers and sort of do things around uh hardware which wasn't what i really was interested in i was really interested in programming or anything like learning languages so rather than doing doing that heavy lifting which is not useful for the business for your business you might as well start using or learning these tools um so copilot's new for me to be honest and i'm uh I'm kind of learning uh, it through through this session, so very excited. Yes, it, well said, Pavan. Really well said. Um, so I think let's. What do you say, Nathan? We just get started and get into the demo. Yeah. And uh, I just really quick, I just want to say we have uh, we have some people from New York. We got California representing here, and usually I see. Let's see. I just wanted to make sure we give all the love here, Coop Jerome. Welcome. Um, I think we, we have uh, sorry. Edge Geek from, yeah, from Northern Colorado. Colorado. I think we have which Christian. for him, I'm just going to say Lambda. Okay, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Argentina, look at that. Okay, yeah, it's really cool. I think Finland. Oh my goodness! Now they're coming in. Uh, Finland, UK, yeah, yeah. Canada. I just want to make sure we give all the love here. Germany. Okay. I can't keep up now. I think I've caused, yeah. caused chaos here. <laughs> um, okay. So welcome. Thanks everybody for, for joining from around the world. We, we appreciate you. So Nathan, let's get into a demo and let's see the good stuff. Yeah. I'm hoping once we actually see the demo, some of these concepts, like before we talked on all these big words around like VPC security groups, I think you'll see that from the demo that a lot of these things are a lot easier when you see them in action. So let first, let me uh, bring up my IDE here, and uh, I'll I'll show what Copilot looks like. So the first thing, I type in the Copilot command. Let me know if this is too small or not, or whether I need to Can, zoom in. Yeah, maybe a little. That, that's a bit better. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so so you can kind of see from this uh, this uh, command line here that Copilot has a few different uh, categories of commands here. There's getting started, uh, which educates you on some of the basic concepts and opens the documentation. There's developing, releasing, and then add-ons and settings. So I've already done some of the preparation work before here, because uh, I know we've talked about Copilot a few times on the show. So I've already developed an application and pushed it initially to the cloud. And that application is a simple service for reversing a string. So in kind of building this material, I, I imagine that I was working for a company which uh, they have this aim to be the ultimate string manipulation API on the internet. Um, they said, you know, string manipulation is hard. We want to provide an API that does all these different operations on strings. And the first one they're going to launch is reversing a string. Um, so they created a, a little Node.js uh, service here. And very simple. I, I didn't want to pull in like too many modules or, or uh, stuff that would uh, uh, add complexity to the system. Um, instead, all it's doing is it's creating a server, it's reading the body of the request, and it's turning that body of the request into a string, and reversing it, and then returning it back to the clients. So I want to take this uh, service and deploy it. And so I've used a couple of Copilot uh, commands to actually do that. So if I type in Copilot app ls, for example, I can see that I've deployed an app I'm calling scd for a standard. You know, just like uh, there's a standard lib, you know, in many languages. So this is going to be the standard lib of uh, string manipulation. So if I type in copilot service show, I can see that I have deployed some services. And you can see the, the list of services here. So I've deployed a service called reverse service. And that is this code here uh, for reversing a string. And I've deployed it to two different environments, a test environment and a production environment. And I have a URL for the application. So if I copy this URL and I send a request to the service, so I'm going to curl um, dash D, that's the flag for sending some data in the body of the request. And I say hello. And I put the address of the service. Um, I get back a reversed version of that string. It's O L L E H there. So 
can do that a few times. And, and this is a live service, so you can feel free to try this out as well. It's at HTTPS reverse .test .string .services. And that's, that's a live URL there that reverses a string. So Copilot has made this super easy. It's, it, it has taken this Node.js code here, just a simple 20 line file, and accompanying that Node.js uh, uh, file, I've got my Docker file. And what this Docker file is doing is it's installing some of my de dependencies that the uh, code needs, and then it's just packaging up uh, my application along with the Node image. So that means that my application will have Node and it will be able to run in an environment. So all this is super easy. And so I can, I can, for example, release an update to my service. If I type uh, Copilot service, I see the list of commands that Copilot offers me. And I see Copilot service in it. That's what I did to actually deploy the service initially. And Copilot service deploy would allow me to redeploy my service. And you can kind of see how that works if I do Copilot service deploy. And hey, Nathan, so a question came in the chat, and it makes me think maybe we should talk a little bit about the concepts in Copilot mm -hmm. and CLI. So a question from Philip um, was, is an environment a cluster in ECS? So maybe you want to describe what an environment represents uh, in, from Copilot? Sure, sure. So that's, that's, that's exactly right. A Copilot uh, environment is basically a cluster uh, that comes with its own uh, resources like VPC, application load balancer, and similar. And it also comes with its own sort of uh, URL namespace. So you can see this your, this long URL here that is, has developed. It's got the uh, service name in it, it's got the environment name in it, and then it's got my um, uh, application name and then my actual subdomain or uh, domain that I own, which is string.services. Uh, so I so I bought this domain string services, and then I launched an environment called test, an environment called prod, and these are isolated environments. They each have their own networking stack. They've got their own cluster and resources, uh, which in this case are Fargate, and they have their own uh, load balancer as well for each of these two different uh, environments. And then I can launch multiple different services in each environment. And I'll talk a, a little bit about why we have these multiple environments when I start getting into the uh, into the pipeline. But fundamentally, the thing to understand is that these are two different, uh, completely isolated places that I can deploy my application as I kind of advance through the stages of development um, of a feature or a, a particular service. So in terms of ECS, then, Nathan, are they two different um, clusters, two different environments altogether? And yeah, yeah, two okay. different clusters entirely. Okay. And I can actually uh, show that if I go into the console here and bring up ECS. And there you go. You see two different services here. I've got my standard uh, test cluster and my standard prod. And you can see because I was actually running an update, it's running two tasks right now because it's launching uh, and deploying a new version of the task in uh, parallel. And uh, the two different versions, version 14 and version 15, are currently running in parallel uh, while version 15 stabilizes and then version 14 will be stopped. So these two different clusters are existing sort of side by side. And I also have some another cluster for a different uh, right. application here, but the two that are the standard test and standard prod. And you didn't have to actually go into the console to create them, right? It, 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 it's nope. done by Copilot. Yep, yep. Uh, Copilot automatically creates that. All I have to do is type in Copilot in it, and mm -hmm. it finds my application. It creates the environment for me automatically. And uh, you'll see as I interact with uh, Copilot a little bit more uh, with the pipeline commands, you'll see how interactive it is with automatically finding these resources and creating things for me. Great. Yeah, and so just a, another quick question to answer is, is this some sort of simulation of an ECS cluster in a local dev box? No, but what, what Nathan's showing us is from his, worksta from his workstation, his laptop, he's able to deploy entire environments um, mm -hmm. with just you know, a command, right? Yep. A, a, a Docker file and you issue a command and Copilot handles the rest. Yeah, this is a live uh, uh, ECS cluster. I'm actually here on the US East 2 console. <laughs> So uh, you're you're seeing this 100% uh, live and unfiltered. <laughs> nice. Um, so 
So, so you know, I kind of showed some of the Copilot commands, and, and you can see that I can interact with Copilot from the command line uh, by typing these commands to, to release an application. Uh, but the thing I want to point out is, you know, when I type in this Copilot service uh, update or service deploy here, and it starts running this deployment, you know, this is, this is an asynchronous uh, operation, but it's kind of blocking my terminal right here, right? You know, if I was doing something else and I started doing the service deploy, um, it's kind of it's doing this in the in the foreground. You know, I have I have to actually wait for this uh, service deployment to finish. And obviously, you know, I could background this task with Control Z, or I could just open another terminal. Um, but it makes me think, okay, maybe this Copilot uh, service deployment isn't something that I want to sit here and wait on day to day. Maybe I don't actually want to use Copilot from the command line. Like this, this was obviously a super easy workflow, you know, to type Copilot service deploy and see it automatically go through building my application and then pushing it and then releasing it on my on my URL. Like that was a great experience, but it's not something that I even want to see day to day. I don't want to have to wait on that. So, is there a way that we can automate this and make this happen in the background? And this is where I want to transition into the uh, AWS Builder library and talk about. Um, some of the ways that we do this at AWS. And hey, so, Nathan, I'm I'm really yeah, sorry. There's just this is a there's a lot of conversation happening in chat, and I, I hate to interrupt you, but I just want to make anytime, sure anytime, anytime <laughs> before we transition. So I want to start with Philip asked a question: Was the ECR image created locally or in the cloud? So do you maybe want to talk through really quick how the application works within Copilot? Yeah. So everything that you saw here in this. Uh, in, in this uh, output here happen locally. Now, there's some caveats here. I'm technically running this from a machine in the cloud that you see down here. I'm actually SSH'd into this box down here. So I'm not actually running the build locally on my laptop. Um, I like to do all my development on an EC2 instance that I actually connect my Visual Studio code to. Um, but you could also do all of this locally. So all these, all these build commands happen wherever you've installed Copilot, whether you, whether that is you installed Copilot on your local laptop or whether you installed it on a server in the cloud. And uh, so it built and then it pushed that to ECR. And at that point that it pushed ECR, it pushed to this URL. So that's now where the image has been hosted. Um, so hopefully that clarifies the answer to that question there. Yeah, I think. Be, and so, you know, one thing with Copilot, when you run like your first time using Copilot, when you run a Copilot init, and mm -hmm. it basically it initializes kind of a, a skeleton structure for your application. And when you think in Copilot, you have an application which encompasses multiple services, right? So your application um, will deploy a load balance service in this case, which has a Docker image that needs an ECR repository. This all happens at that initialization phase, right, Nathan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I've kind of, to save some time, I've kind of skipped that initial initialization. But you can see here, I've brought up the manifest mm -hmm. that was created for the service. And you can see that it has specified a location for the Docker file, the port, and other different parameters of the application that's being built. And so now, all I have to do is I say, uh, basically, that was super easy for me. All I did was copilot in it, and it, it selected and found those settings. And now, all I have to do is type copilot service deploy, and it uses these settings that have been predetermined in the manifest. Uh, to go through this process of rebuilding the service, repushing it, and running the new version um, so, in the cloud. So I have a question here, Nathan. So when you click or when you type in Copilot in it, where does the manifest have to be in the same directory for for it? Where where does it need to be? Yeah. So here's my uh, project folder, AWS Copilot uh, Pipeline is what I call this uh, this particular project. And I ran my commands from the root of this particular folder. And so inside this folder structure, you can kind of see my, how I've laid out my, my application. I have my app inside of here. Um, I have my tests specified here, which we'll get to later. And then I have this folder, magic folder here called Copilot. Well, this folder was created by Copilot. And this is where Copilot stores all the information about uh, what application needs to be built and pushed. Uh, to the cloud. And here you can see it's made a folder called reverse, which is the name of that application. And inside of that is the manifest, which is this file I have open here, which is the settings for that application, like how right. much CPU with memory. 
So when you say copilot init, would you specify the name of the application like copilot init reverse? Uh huh. Well, I like I I like to just type copilot init, and then it'll pop up basically a wizard, and it'll ask me names okay. like what would you like to name my application? You know, what type of application you want to deploy? Load balanced web service in this case, um, and you know how much memory and CPU. These are all these are all things that then I can go into this manifest and and modify them after the fact. So, man, there are so many good questions. So I just want to run through these because I really, um, I think the, the context of today is to really demo the CI CD functionality. So I'm going to run through a couple of questions and then I want to get into that, but just a couple more. Um, so like, you know, would you use Fargate for a WordPress website? This type of orchestration looks awesome. So, so yes, um, you could definitely use Copilot uh, to deploy a WordPress installation. There's some caveats, obviously uh, with Fargate, it's intended to be a stateless system. And although there is ways to attach a stateful storage now, um, I think that in, 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 in general, uh, you would want to customize your WordPress installation to be stateless as well, which is possible. So for example, you can customize it so that way your uploads go into S3 and you can break your database out and run your database as a separate service. And for example, uh, Amazon RDS or similar. Um, once you have done that work and done that configuration for your WordPress site, then you could totally uh, very easily deploy your WordPress container to Fargate. Uh, but I just want to say as a caveat, like you, you could, um, but you wouldn't want to just do like a standard out of the box WordPress installation. You would need to customize your WordPress configuration to have the right plugins installed and the right configuration to have your state for your actual posts and your uploads stored outside of Fargate uh, in S3 or RDS. And we did, we, with Fargate and ECS, we did just recently release EFS support. I don't believe at this moment Copilot supports that. Is uh, Not technically. Uh, we're, we, we have a, uh, support for storage. So you'll see that as a uh, command here as options for storage, commands for working with storage and databases. And currently we're focusing on like DynamoDB and S3, uh, some of the ones that are a little bit easier to start with. And there's support for creating your own add-ons for customizing your service. Uh, this will become more and more full featured over time. We have a roadmap for that. And we welcome you to create issues on the project if you have something in particular that you want to see added, like EFS support. Um, we're working on making more examples for that as well so that you have easier ways to attach more of the storage to your Copilot tasks. Cool. Yeah, and, and I know that the development team for, for Copilot, they're, they're easy to engage with. They, they want your sure. feedback. I'm pretty sure they're in the chat right now. So, uh, if you, if you folks are in the chat, please say hello. I'm sure F A or or David. I hope at least one of them's here. That'd be nice to say, get a, a nice little emoji from them. So, okay, Nathan, please continue. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you were on a roll, and I had to interrupt you. <laughs> no, it's all good. I love answering the uh, questions. I think it's uh, very important. Um, so, I want to talk. Uh, you know, we we showed all these things being done by hand. I want to talk about automation now and how we do automation at AWS. So there's this great article by Claire Liberty um, called Automating Safe Hands-Off Deployments. And it talks, uh, I'm not gonna go through every aspect of this, but I highly recommend, maybe we could drop the link in chat, uh, looking at this uh, article later, and because it goes through how we think about uh, production deployments at Amazon and the process that, that we go through. And the important thing I want to highlight right now is the four pipeline phases. So you start with your source code, you build your source code, you test it, and then it reaches production. And you'll see I created two environments earlier, right? In Copilot, I created a test environment and I created a prod environment. Well, this is the reason why, is because I want to have these stages of collecting my source code, building my source code, uh, deploying it to a test environment, and then deploying it to a production environment. And this goes through a lot of different ways that you can test all the way to really rigorous uh, test environments. Uh, the test environment that I want to set up in this case is an integration test, so which is this first integration test developed uh, or discussed in, the, in this um, section right here. A lot of times, you know, when I talk about uh, testing a service, I get a little bit of pushback or a little bit of worry from developers. I uh, you know some developers have you know, they kind of have a little bit of a negative reaction test or they just say, you know, I want to develop features and tests take a lot of time to develop. Uh, you know, they hold me back. They're always breaking. Well, I think that 
tests can be done in a way which doesn't slow you down and which benefits your application greatly. And I think that really starts with integration tests. Like if you're working at a company right now that doesn't have tests, the probably the first test that you should start thinking about is integration test. And the reason why is that an integration test basically interacts with your service just like a real user would. And so it, it offers the highest, I think, value uh, to time uh, proposition when it comes to developing tests. Um, generally, like let's say you have a service and user has to sign up and then sign in and then they take like, let's say a few different top level actions like let's say if it was an online store searching for a product and then adding the product to car cart and then checking out. Well, if you have an integration test where there's a simulated agent which goes through those steps and just hits those top you know, five or six actions that a user would take against your service, well, that's going to already catch 90% of the major bugs that would impact users in production. Um, so I highly recommend integration tests. And that's the type of test that uh, we're going to be setting up in this uh, pipeline very shortly. <laughs> well said. Test, 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 test. Very important. <laughs> Heck yeah. Test your code. <laughs> All right. so. I want to show the copilot uh, pipeline commands here. So copilot pipeline. And you, you'll, you'll see a lot of the same commands over and over again when I interact with copilot. There's always copilot in it, uh, something like copilot update, delete, and show. So if we do copilot show right now, well, there's a, uh, whoops, copilot pipeline show. There's uh, currently uh, no pipelines yet. We're about to create one. So I'm going to do copilot, apply, copilot in it. Uh, pipeline in it. And we're going to see how Copilot sort of walks you through the process interactively. So it starts out saying, would you like to add an environment to your pipeline? And yes or no. Well, you know, obviously I want to add environment. So it asks me which environment I would like to add. I select test. And it says, would you like to add another environment to your pipeline? Once again, yes. Uh, so I have two environments here. The second environment is production. Now, the next thing it's going to ask is what GitHub repository would I like to use for this service? Now, I've already pushed this code uh, to GitHub, and the local uh, Git repository that I'm working in, uh, it's already picked up the name and address of that Git repository, which is Nathan Peck slash string dash reverse. So I'm just going to press Enter to select that pre-existing GitHub. And then it asks, please enter your GitHub personal access token for your repository. Now, this is where some people might get a little bit worried, like, okay, what is this personal access token? And I want to show you, it's actually uh, fairly simple to set up. If I go to my GitHub account. Do you, do you want me to hide your screen or anything? Oh, no, no, I, I, don't worry. I've practiced this. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to uh, <laughs> leak my uh, leak Famous my Famous last access. words. <laughs> cool. So I go to uh, I go to GitHub and I click Developer Settings and I click Personal Access Tokens and what this is going to do is it's going to create a token which um, allows uh, Copilot and AWS to interact with my GitHub uh, repo on my behalf and watch for updates on my Git repo and then take action as like automatically redeploying my service in response to creating a token. So I click uh, generate token and I have to select a couple of scopes. So I select repo scope. I'm saying, yes, uh, this has access to read the, the repo content. So that way obviously it needs to read the code in order to build my application. And I select admin, uh, it's an admin repo hook. So when it creates a hook, that's what allows it to actually watch the contents of the repo. And when I push a change to my repo, it'll pick that up and start taking action on it. Now I click generate token. Now I've actually already have a token that I generated in the past. So I'm just going to uh, copy that pre-existing token out of my password manager rather than creating another token uh, here alive. And uh, if I go back over here, I can paste that token in and there we go. So you see a bunch of output here it's describing what it did. But the important thing is that it has actually created a uh, pipeline manifest file and it's created a, a build spec for what to do during that pipeline. I can open that up and inspect it. 
And you, so I just wanted to add, like, so, so co-pilot for your first experience, you know, I recommend you don't um, pass any parameters into your commands. Go through the interactive experience, you know, you know, answer the questions, see kind of what the workflow looks like from the, the CLI perspective. Then once you're comfortable and you're ready to start, you know, kind of issuing commands, just one click commands, then you can start passing these things that Nathan did with the Q&A section of, of the CLI, you could just pass those in as parameters to the co-pilot CLI, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, I hate trying to remember command line flags though. So to be honest, I always just go through the wizard. Like, And it's nice. If, if I have to remember what a flag is called and then like what to enter for the flag, like I'd rather it just ask me and because it also prompts me automatically. Like for example, it says, is this your GitHub repo? And yeah, it found the right GitHub repo. So I all have to just press enter. <laughs> It's a great point. And uh, <laughs> Philip said, you know, so the, the code pipeline feature will save so much time. I've spent hours configuring Jenkins jobs for all services in each of my other clusters. As uh, Philip, I don't know if you've heard on the show, Brent and others call me the Jenkins guy. I, I don't know how <laughs> I got uh, pigeonholed there, but anyways, I feel your pain there. So this is definitely a huge time saver and you don't have to worry about that anymore. Absolutely. <laughs> So, and just to show you, compared to Jenkins, how much easier it is to configure the pipeline that Copilot creates. So here in this pipeline file, the pipeline definition file, very basic. It just specifies the source of the pipeline, uh, which is my repository here, and the name of the secret uh, GitHub token um, that authorizes access to that GitHub. And then I just specify the list of stages. So the stage is the name of the environment I want to deploy to. I want to deploy to test first. And then I wanted to deploy to prod. And what I've actually added here is test commands. And this is where the integration test is going to take place. So the test commands are first installing some dependencies for the test. And then it's specifying the application URL that I want to test against, which is the environment uh, URL for that test environment. And NPM test, which kicks off the test. And I can show you what that test ends up looking like over here in, the, uh, in that code. The test is super basic uh, as integration tests actually usually are. Um, you can see that it's just defining the environment URL that I want to make a request against. And then it's making a web request and sending the body hello. And that's verifying that the response text equals the string reversed. So this is all I really need for integration tests for the service, right? It's just going to verify that I can send a string and that the string comes back properly reversed. So at this point, um, it's created these files for the pipeline and Copilot gives me some helpful um, ideas about what I need to do next. One of the most important things to do actually is, uh, is push my uh, update to the, to the commit, uh, push my uh, commit, get commit, and then get pushed. And I have actually already uh, committed this. So let me do a get push. And uh, that's going to push the code up. And then I can do a, a copilot pipeline update. And so this is going to uh, start actually creating that pipeline resource on the AWS side. And I'll show you what that looks like over here in the console. So if I switch back over, everything that, uh, that copilot does, by the way, is using CloudFormation under the, under the covers. So if I go to look at this, um, I can see a list of long list of different cloud formation stacks that have been created. And many of these have actually been created by Copilot themselves. So all these ones that are standard test, standard prod. Uh, these are all uh, Copilot managed um, cloud formation templates. And the one that I just picked off right here is the pipeline. So this is actually creating a, a code pipeline for my service. And if I go to code pipeline, I see a pipeline has been created. I click into that and I can see that it's already uh, beginning to take action. It's on the first stage, the source stage of actually pulling my code down and kicking off the build. This is great. I mean, um, as a user who I, I, I'm a developer, I just wanted to develop an application uh, and test it um, quickly. I, I didn't have to learn the sort of basics or fundamentals around ECS clusters and how to bring them up. 
and mm -hmm. also code pipeline. So I don't have to interact with the with the API of code pipeline, and it just does it for you. So as you just showed, I have to stay in my um, VS code and just focus on my app. Um, this is really strong. So I mean, this is as I said, I'm I'm with all the viewers as well, learning from you. So really exciting. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. <laughs> so there, there's um, just a couple questions here. So one was, you know, is there some sort of provisioning of storage in the middle of all this? So I think you answered that with cloud formation. I, I will say Copilot also uses SSM to store some, you know, just some key values related to your overall application. But generally cloud formation is that state management system for your environments. Um, and then there was another question from NetHold. Do we have a list of additional uh, permissions that are required to make use of, of Copilot? And in this use case, it'd be working in a restricted environment where they may not have you know, admin access, So, mm -hmm. and they don't want to have to chase down all the different permissions they need. Yeah, so we can take a look at that, actually. Uh, so if I go to CloudFormation, and I look at my pipeline stack and look at the resources, I'm pretty sure we're going to see uh, some roles in here. So there's a pipeline role, and there's a build project role. And we can actually look at these IAM roles to see what permissions uh, were utilized for the pipeline and for the build. So the first one I'm looking at here is the, uh, <clears throat> the pipeline role. And if I expand this, you can see the list of different resources uh, that it needs to, to touch, mostly related to cloud formation. Um, S3, IAM, code build, and a code pipeline. And uh, also yeah, I had, I, oh, go ahead, sorry. And then keep on, keep on going down, KMS, S3, and STS, assume role. And there was a tweet I had, uh, <laughs> I had tweeted uh, not too long ago about, um, about how to see, uh, how, using a, the AWS CLI, how to actually um, see what uh, resources your particular user role or, or uh, resource is is touching and oh, true. interacting yeah, with. So I'll, I'll post that in here when I find it. But anyway, so and one last question, does this work with um, EKS? Uh, kind of like this is kind of like CDK for deploying EKS, but no, this specifically is is for ECS and exclusively. Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, this is exclusively for um, for ECS uh, at the moment. Uh, we're designing it also uh, exclusively at the beginning for Fargate. So the whole point is that this will create a serverless container uh, deployment for your application. You know, I don't have to think about uh, any control plane resources because ECS is fully serverless. I don't have to think about any of the uh, hosting uh, EC2 resources that are actually running the container because that's fully serverless as well. And uh, the result what? is that, oh yeah, and the most important thing is I don't have to think about any of the pipeline or build resources either, because that is also fully serverless. Yeah. This, this whole thing is serverless end to end. Like I remember back when I used to run uh, Jenkins myself, uh, you know, as Adam can testify, <laughs> <laughs> uh, running Jenkins was, uh, was a pain. I actually had like a build box that was in the office sitting over there on a desk running Jenkins. <laughs> and that was the resources that I had to manage. Every once in a while, I had to go in there and apply patches or like figure out why Jenkins had crashed, right? Well, this now is a fully serverless pipeline and fully serverless build. I can actually uh, kick off a bunch of these pipelines or builds in parallel without ever thinking about you know what resources or what machine behind the scenes is, is actually running this. Um, so one question around the um, scaling ability. Like uh, if I'm if I'm a developer, responsible for a microservice around payment and it's Christmas and you know, I've, I have, I have a, I'm using Copilot for this, right? So mm -hmm. would my app scale with the traffic? Let's say your reverse string app, would it, how much load can it handle? Like, is there a way to test the load or how can we, what's the underlying scaling mechanisms? Yeah, so right now it doesn't auto scale out of the box by default. Um, but I can go to this manifest right here, and I can increase the uh, CPU and memory, and I can also incre increase the count of tasks. So, you know, if I had an application that had gigantic Christmas spike, 
you know, I give this some beefy CPU and memory and I probably launched, you know, like 10, 20, you know, however many that I actually needed. And uh, it would just run in Fargate. You know, I wouldn't even have to think about the EC2 services uh, behind the scenes. Um, I just get that many Fargate tests. But I do know there is a, a GitHub issue out there. Um, I believe it was uh, David that put it out talking about auto scaling and the, mm -hmm. what what we're thinking about with implementing this. So this is a functionality that will be introduced to the Copilot Copilot CLI at some point. Oh, and there you go, FA. This is why I love having them, the the people who build it here in the chat. So it should be released <laughs> in the next version uh, of Copilot. So and they they move pretty quickly. It's it's fun to watch. Oh yeah, there's so, new, there's new releases almost every week, so it's very exciting to see. <laughs> uh, and so there was a question. Um, you know, I'm new to AWS, still learning. Can I use Copilot um, with the free tier? So I do we have Fargate free? I, I that's so, a good question. Unfortunately, uh, Fargate is not currently in the free tier. Uh, Plus, so, there's VPC, there's networking, ingress, egress. There's quite a few things that go into that, right? So um, probably not. On the bright side, uh, running a Fargate task, you know, even all month is fairly cheap. Like if you've ever been to one of our AWS workshops and gotten like an AWS credit code, chances are like they'll fully cover the cost of, of, of running a small co the default copilot task of uh, one, was it one task? One task with 256 CPU memory. Like even if you just have like a tiny like ten dollar credit on your account, you should be good. Yeah. Um, maybe one of the developers can can clarify because I know we we put a lot of work into optimizing this for cost. I don't remember what it came out to like what the rough cost was for running this container for a month, but I remember it was tiny. It was like the co co cost of a cup of coffee or something, right? Um, yeah. So so if you do if you are lucky to have attended one of our events and gotten like a, a learning credit uh, to apply on your account, chances are it's going to cover that. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to be running some more like online workshops and stuff through, through COVID. I know we used to do so many of those, uh, in-person, uh, workshops and give out those credits, but we need to find a way to give those credits out now. <laughs> Definitely. And a little, little teaser is speaking of workshops, we are working on co-pilot integration with ECS workshop. So yeah, yeah. So then you'll be able that. To that workshop and, and, and that will give you a chance to work on uh, co-pilot as well. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. All right, so let me show this pipeline now. It's been progressing as we were talking. So it started by a source. It went to build a phase, which was actually uh, building my image and pushing it. And then it went to the deploy phases. So the first phase is deploying to the test environment, uh, which was using CloudFormation. And that actually updated my service on ECS with the new version of the service. And then it went to a, uh, a test phase, which is actually running the test. So I can see the output um, of these different phases by clicking on details. So let me show the, uh, the this phase first, which was the actual CloudFormation deployment. I can see if I click through here, the events, I can see as each of these different resources got updated, the task definition and the service got updated to a new version of my service. And then I can actually see the test output by clicking on details. And as like, scroll down through here, I can see that it installed my test dependencies. And then it started running my actual tests against the service, which in this case was testing to see if I was able to uh, reverse the string. And I actually just realized that uh, apparently my uh, my pipeline uh, jumped the gun and I, I pushed the, uh, the uh, newer version of the code rather than the previous version. <laughs> so I actually already pushed my uh, integration uh, test for uh, reversing a simple string as well as reversing a string that contains a, a UTF-8 characters because I, I pushed the wrong branch. <laughs> but um, uh, so basically, I'm able to see that these uh, uh, tests have passed here. But I can actually go back and verify that I can break uh, these uh, tests uh, and verify that the service actually broke. So let me go back here. And yes, let's, let's break it. Nathan, yeah. Nathan just a quick time check we have uh, we uh, we have 10 minutes Ooh, actually yeah i don't know if i have time to actually break the uh break the build in and verify that the test can actually uh block the uh update from hitting production <laughs> but you you have a blog post on this right yeah, which yeah. I, I we shared in the chat so 
we should be able to reference that and see this example. Um, yeah, basically, like uh, the thing the thing I, I want to get across the the most important thing is that if I'm in this pipeline and I do have an issue with my with my service where the tests fail, uh, this part turns red. It never actually goes through to deploying to prod. And so that serves as this important safeguard. Like I can be confident that that I push my code, the code deployed, the test ran against it, and because they passed, it was able to go through to production. So this serves as a safeguard um, against accidentally breaking my deployment in production. And the important thing also that I want to want to point out is that I can kick all of this off by just doing a git push. So you know if I commit a change to my application and then I do git push. Uh, and get commit, get push, this pipeline starts running again automatically. I don't even actually have to use copilot commands um, anymore. Um, I actually don't even have to have copilot installed on my machine. And so this is important because when you have multiple developers in your organization, uh, anytime you go over one developer, you end up with uh, drift. Like maybe one person will have one version of the tooling installed, another person will have another version installed. And what I've ran into in the past is that one developer maybe is trying to utilize tooling to build and push the application. And another developer has like an older version of that same tooling and they end up like rolling something back or breaking something. Um, I, I found this very important to have like this kind of centralized pipeline uh, like Copilot sets up because it ensures that the tooling is 100% consistent and everybody is using all this same tooling um, inside the pipeline for the source and build and deploy. Uh, and you don't you don't have that problem anymore. Yeah, and, and so there was a question around that, which will pop up again, was how does Copilot handle state um, when there are, say, 10 developers on a team all creating features in the same repo, yet simultaneously not having access to the final production AWS account? And mm -hmm. I just, I think you touched on a lot of that. And I think Copilot's good to get you this everything built really easily. And once you have the pipeline up, Git becomes your source of truth. So you have 10 developers. If if all 10 commits get merged at the same time, basically this is just code pipeline is going to run in the order that it receives each commit. So yeah, um, so it'll actually queue them up. So let's say I do make a change here. I'm just going to make a little change that like adds a comment. And so then I go back over here, get status. Okay, and making a change, and then I do a git push. Um, you'll see that it'll pick that up and it'll, after a few uh, minutes or seconds, seconds or minutes, seconds to minutes, I've seen it take 30 seconds sometimes, a minute or two, it'll pick up that there was a change to the source. And what happens is, is if another developer also pushed a change at the same time, um, the pipeline runs through in a linear fashion. So let's say one build went through to source and then it reached the build phase. Well, the second uh, build would be coming down the line from source. It would hit source and then block and wait for the other, for, wait for the next phase of the build to succeed. And so you can have multiple um, things going through. So yeah, here you can see this updated. It found my source and pulled the source down and it reached the uh, build phase. And so it's pushing that comment change, right? So now if I go back over and change this again, test two, and I repeat that process of get add, and then push that again. You'll see, I, I could actually have multiple developers uh, pushing changes simultaneously, and the pipeline is not going to break. It is capable of realizing that there's multiple things in the pipeline in multiple different phases, and it won't allow them to sort of progress past each other. In fact, CloudFormation uh, which is the mechanism used for updating the service, also has built-in protections where only one stack update can actually happen at a time. So as it goes for, through from build to the deploy phase, um, that will also ensure that only one change happens at a specific time before it, it goes through to the next phase. And, you know, so F.A. did mention a, a good point. Um, someone asked, is it still in beta? It's not officially GA, so we're careful not to introduce any breaking changes. We're in preview to collect as much feedback as possible at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it is, I think, important to just consider. But I want to go to one last thing on, on this um, 
on that question from from Mike in chat was, I think you know, Copilot again, Copilot is going to get you the environments and the kind of all, everything you need to get your application from test to production. And once you have that all deployed, use Git. Don't continue to use Copilot to iterate on, on changes for the same app. Git becomes your source of, of code review, you know, and then once that code's merged, let the CI CD handle the rest. Obviously, and this is where testing is, is really important, right? So as you can see, Nathan added these tests because prior to our code getting to production, we want to make sure we are testing uh, in our test environment automatically. Right. You, you notice Nathan didn't deploy any humans to run these tests. He had code to run these tests. So the idea is your code should should test itself um, and, and let you know if you've if something's failed prior to it getting released to production. It, it's actually all code all the way down. It's code verifying code. That's the cool thing. So about much tests. code. I love it. <laughs> um, so well, I, I just want to show this really quick like because yes. I answer that question about multiple devs. So here you can see there's multiple stages here. They're actually blue, they're in progress. So it's building a new version of the application at the same time that it is deploying the previous version of the application. And these things are queued up. So this build won't actually deploy until this deployment is done and has verified and tested. So this is how we ensure that it's kind of like the, the traffic can stack up and everything will queue up, but you won't have conflicts. Great. It's great to see that everything in terms of the pipeline is all set up through Copilot, and and then the developers can just work on the on the Git uh, repository, so GitHub repository. So uh, we have oh. one one last question before we close. Is um, I think it's a simple one. Um, is this using a Firecracker or Bottle Rocket instance at the on the back end? So uh, so you... this, this is using uh, Fargate behind the scenes. So uh, we're not currently using Bottle Rocket. Uh, uh, Bottle Rocket is more for, you know, you're running on EC2 instance. Um, and uh, I, I think we'll, we'll talk more about Bottle Rocket. We've already had a few different sessions on Bottle Rocket uh, here on containers from the couch. So we'll see, see more about that in the future. Cool. cool. Nice. Well, okay. So Nathan, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a, an awesome demo. Great questions um, from the audience. So thank you everyone for, for participating and chatting with us. Um, so you can get this information. Uh, let me just run through this. So the Copilot CLI um, on GitHub, if you're interested, um, check it out. Uh, great walkthroughs, by the way, just in the, in the GitHub yeah. repo. Um, and then Nathan's blog as well. So everything Nathan talked about today, he wrote a really awesome blog about. So if you want to kind of run through this in written form, check out his blog, um, which will walk you through everything he talked about today. I've but, got the links to the GitHub and everything. Perfect. Oh, because there was a question about is this in, in Git? So that's fantastic. Um, yep, perfect. I, I, Pavan, thank you. So containersfromthecouch.com, ecsworkshop.com. Um, someone had asked about links and resources to learning about ECS and Fargate. So uh, check those out. But Thank you, everybody, so much. And um, tomorrow for next week, yeah, uh, yeah. Tomorrow's week. containers from the couch weekend, so we will see you on, uh, next week. Yeah, Monday. All right. Uh, on Monday. Yes. Thank yeah. you. All right. See you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See you.